pretty much knew who was running. <clears throat> but the end was still far from near. Resting on laurels was not an option, because pitching a perfect game necessitates attention to detail for every single pitch. One false step from the mound and the opposing batter takes you yard. The New York Giants bent but did not break. They attacked every down. They willed themselves to a lead for a good portion of the second half. But even with all their hard work, they still found themselves in need to make plays in the final moments instead of trying to preserve a victory. In that way, David Tyree's incredible catch, which is probably the best catch in football history, was kind of like the game-changing moment when John McCain, attempting to appeal to conservatives who'd like to believe that things are just fine the way they are, blew the coverage and gave Camp Obama the window they needed. Now, one could argue that the crucial moment was when McCain asked Sarah Palin to keep him company, and the initial electricity yes, sound yes. surrounding that faded into skepticism and even disbelief at the irresponsibility. But even with that misstep, and even with Obama's perfectly executed game plan, the final touch came when McCain boldly pronounced the foundation of the economy was sound, only to see it collapse just moments later. Camp Obama had found Plaxico in one-on-one -on -one coverage in the back of the end zone, and at this point all they needed was to prevent Brady from getting a deep one past him. Mm -hmm. McCain struggled to stay afloat, and for that matter tried desperately to make waves as the campaign closed. But it's hard to make a ripple in that pool sitting next to Obama who's got the jacuzzi bubbles popping. Mm -hmm. No one ever really bought into McCain's attempts to grab back momentum. And although his supporters publicly congratulated with their support for his debate performances, they quietly divided and compartmentalized Blaine, planning their escape routes. Uh -huh. <laughs> On November 4th, 2008, there was a magical feeling about it. It swept from the shores of the Atlantic all the way across the world and back again. Billions of people, electric currents of change running through them, anticipated what we all knew was coming, even though we still could not believe it. There aren't too many days when you wake up and know the world will be different by the time you go to sleep. Most of our landmark days sneak up on us in some harsh and welcome way, like waking up to airplane bombs over Manhattan skylines, <coughs> or watching people who escaped house-high water drown in government neglect. Mm -hmm. But this day, every second that ticked by brought us closer to our new president and closer to a connection with our fellow Americans most of us have never known. And every second hung from our consciousness with bittersweet <coughs> anticipation. It was like if God combined Christmas Eve and your birthday, magnified them by 10, and divided into one event that you know people had waited lifetimes to see, and others had passed through lifetimes waiting for. It's 11 o'clock now, and we can announce Barack Obama is projected to be the next president of the United States. They flash a screen of an American map, and on the left side, the three states that were once ago gray now turn blue, with the number 284 beaming back. There is a world parties as cameras flash all over the country, with people of all ethnicities screaming at the top of their lungs. Some are crying and overcome with joy that rarely happens. Young black people who have never had any interest in anything political are hugging and kissing each other. Mm -hmm. A church in Atlanta explodes and dances song as speakers blare out, being drowned out by the deafening crowd's chants, Here I am, baby. Ooh, sign sealed, delivered, I'm yours. <laughs> I take a moment to embrace the sincerity on these people's faces. People personally invested in a man who will never know them individually. People I will never meet, but am connected to with the deepest of my emotions. I keep hearing these guys talk about how this victory isn't, isn't about black America, it's about all of America. And maybe that's true, but it's about black America. I have no doubt that America will be better off while, while Barack is president, but black people in America will be better off from now on and every, every point forward because of it. I'm racing home because the ladies' house we were watching <laughs> election coverage by is closed. I'm listening to the beginning of the acceptance speech on the radio, but I want to see it, so I'm driving like a madman. <coughs> Only the guy in front of me is driving crazy. I think to myself, at least they'll have to stop him before me. <laughs> but then I decide to pass him because I'm a black president now, and that makes me immune to jail anyway. Yeah. <laughs> I pull up to the house and run to the door, and the car I was racing with pulls in the driveway behind me, and I realize the crazy driver was my dad. <laughs> As I open the door, I hear Barack's voice blaring from his car speakers. Without even turning to see him, I come in. 
I only have two memories of watching an election of any kind. The primary when Jesse Jackson lost a bid to be the Democratic nominee, and when Mondale was defeated by Reagan. I was sitting with my parents on both occasions. Both times we were on the wrong side of victory. Both times feeling that sense of hopelessness I had talked about earlier. By the time Bush Jr. was being put into office, I think I was too dispassionate to even care about elections anymore. But 2008 had renewed for this family an interest and investment with our election process and our America. I run to the TV and in the next room I hear my dad popping the champagne bottle as I listen to Barack speak to the world. He tells us about a woman who in her youth didn't even have the imagination to consider a black president since it wasn't obvious that at that time she would ever be able to vote or for that matter share water funds with white folks or live out the reign of the KKK. He tells those who didn't vote for him that he's their president too, like it or not. He doesn't say the like it or not because he's not an, antagon an antagonistic person. But the 60 million of us that voted for him here, he speaks of those of us who've been forced into cynicism and skepticism about our government and how, how we can feel good about ourselves now. And I wonder for a second if he's been reading my blog where cynicism and skepticism thrive. He stands tall atop the mountain where he tried to climb before being pulled back down and to all the world speaks with the authority of a president, the reverence of a man taking on a task larger than himself, and the confidence of a leader with billions of followers simultaneously chanting his name as if Obama is a Latin root that means yes we can. Mm -hmm. I thought of all the people who felt so passionately for this man. All the ideals I had assumed when I was young that one should feel for the man we call president came pouring out in me and reflected on the face of Americans from the streets of San Francisco to Grant Park, down south to Atlanta, back up to Harlem. Their approval was mirrored across the Atlantic to Africa, right through Europe, to China, and then back again to America. In my youth, I would visualize myself in place of a secret service agent and wonder what motivated a man to have a job that might mean dying for another man. I never saw the face of a man I would die for in any of these men. I'm sorry, that might have needed protection. For that matter, I couldn't even say I understood the motivations of service men and women who defended a country at the mandate of men mandating for personal gain. But on this night, I looked on through glassy eyes at the only man not related to me I would die for because I would be doing it for my country, which I've never believed more strongly is a place worth dying for. And even though I cheer for America in the Olympics, and even though I have no desire to look abroad, and even though I'd rather eat a steak than escargot, for the first time ever, I was proud to be an American. As Barack finished his speech, I stood in the living room with my parents and sister, and we toasted each other like it was New Year's Eve. A fresh start, a new day, a new country. It's not the first time the world has changed before our eyes. We watched planes crash into buildings. We watched our city swamp and burn. But all those events, all those martyrs, did not happen for nothing. They did not happen so that rich men could get richer, gouging gas prices and selling us war helicopters. They died and we suffered through it so we can reach this day when all of mankind is better off because we have someone like us who feels that government is not here to exploit a people but to serve and protect a people. And on this day we can look into the eyes of a man who speaks from his heart the same sentiments we feel in ours. His heart and ours speak yes we can. He states we are not celebrating because we won an election but merely the chance to put things right that have gone astray. But I submit we have already won because somewhere there's a little boy who can toss aside a Vibe magazine and find his identity in a Newsweek. Mm -hmm. We have already won because the world now remembers that integrity and service are the kind of things that make leaders, and those who strive to be leaders will strive for those qualities. We have won because the world is already a better place when Joe Biden's white, blonde-haired grandkids can stand on a stage and hold hands and hug Barack's nappy-haired black kids and, <laughs> the whole world. and Martin Luther King can stop rolling in his grave and waiting for him. We have already won because Barack Obama is president, and all it took was 400 years of inequality and two years of perfection. Oh